De Dallas and Icarus by Geraldine Macari. The island of Crete was ruled by King Minos, whose reputation for wickedness had spread to every shore. One day he summoned to his country a famous inventor named Daedalus. Come, Daedalus, and bring your son Icarus, too. I have a job for you, and I pay well. King Minos wanted Daedalus to build him a palace with soaring towers and a high, curving roof. In the cellars there was to be a maze of many corridors, so twisting and dark that any man who once ventured in there would never find his way out again. What is it for? asked Daedalus. What is, is it a treasure vault? Is it a prison to hold criminals? But Minos only replied, Build my labyrinth as I told you. I pay you to build, not ask questions. So Daedalus held his tongue and set to work. When the palace was finished, he looked at it with pride, for there was nowhere in the world so fine. But when he found out the purpose of the maze in the cellar, he shuddered with horror. For at the heart of that maze, King Minos put a creature that was half man, half beast, a thing almost too horrible to describe. He called it the Minotaur, and he fed it on women, men and women. Then Daedalus wanted to leave Crete at once and forget both the maze and the Minotaur. So he went to King Minos to ask for his money. I regret, said King Minos, I cannot let you leave Crete, Daedalus. You are the only man who knows the secret of the maze and how to escape from it. The secret must never leave this island, so I'm afraid I must keep you and Icarus here a while longer. How much longer? gasped Daedalus. Oh, just until you die, replied Minos cheerfully, but never mind. I have plenty of work for a man as clever as you. Daedalus and Icarus lived in great comfort in King Minos's palace. But they lived the life of prisoners. Their rooms were in the tallest palace tower with beautiful views across the island. They ate delectable food and wore expensive clothes. But at night, the door of their fine apartment was locked and a guard stood outside. It was a comfortable prison, but it was a prison even so. Daedalus was deeply unhappy. Every day, he put a seed out on the windowsill for the birds. He liked to study their brilliant colors the clever overlapping of their feathers, and the way they soared on the sea wind. It comforted him to think that they, at least, were free to come and go. The birds had only to spread their wings and they could leave Crete behind them, whereas Daedalus and Icarus must stay forever in their luxurious cage. Young Icarus could not understand his father's unhappiness. But I like it here, he said. The king gives us gold and this tall tower to live in. Daedalus groaned. But to work for such a wicked man, Icarus, and to be prisoners all our days, we shan't stay, we shan't. But we can't get away, can we, said Icarus. How can anybody escape from an island? Fly? He snorted with laughter. Daedalus did not answer. He scratched his head and stared out of the window at the birds, pecking seed on the sill. From that day onward, he got up early each morning and stood at the open window. When a bird came for the seed, Daedalus begged it to spare him one feather. Then each night, when everyone else had gone to bed, Daedalus worked by candlelight on his greatest invention of all. Early mornings, late nights, a whole year went by. Then one morning, Icarus was awakened by his father shaking his shoulder. Get up, Icarus, and don't make a sound. We are leaving Crete. But how? It's impossible. Daedalus pulled out a bundle from under his bed. I've been making something, Icarus. Inside were four great folded fans of feathers. He stretched them out on the bed. They were wings. I sewed the feathers together with strands of wool for my blanket. Now hold still. Daedalus melted down a candle and daubed his son's shoulders with sticky wax. Yes, I know it's hot, but it will soon cool. While the wax was still soft, he stuck two wings to Icarus's shoulder blades. Now you must help me put on my wings, son. When the wax sets hard, you and I will fly away from here free as birds. I'm scared, whispered Icarus as he stood the narrow window ledge, his knees knocking and his huge wings drooping down behind. The lawns and the courtyards of the palace lay far below. The royal guards look small as ants. This won't work. Courage, son, said Daedalus. Keep your arms out wide and fly close to me. Above all, are you listening, Icarus? Yes, father. Above all, don't fly too high. Don't fly too close to the sun. Don't fly too close to the sun, Icarus repeated with his eyes tight shut. 
Then he gave a cry as his father nudged him off the windowsill. He plunged downward. With a crack, the feathers fell be behind him, filled with wind, and Icarus found himself flying. I'm flying, he crowed. The guards looked up in astonishment and wagged their swords and pointed and shouted, Tell the king, Daedalus and Icarus are, are flying away. By dipping first one wing, then the other, Icarus found that he could turn to the left and to the right. The wind tugged at his hair. His legs trailed out behind him. He saw the fields and streams as he had never seen them before. Then they were out over the sea. The seagulls pecked at him angrily, so Icarus, Icarus flew higher where they could not reach him. He copied their shrill cry and taunted them. You can't catch me. Now remember, don't fly too high, called Daedalus, but his words were drowned by the screaming of the gulls. I'm the first boy ever to fly. I'm making history. I shall be famous, thought Icarus as he flew up and up, higher and higher. At last, Icarus was looking the sun itself in the face. Think you're the highest thing in the sky, do you? He jeered. I can fly just as high as you, higher even. He did not notice the drops of sweat on his forehead. He was so determined to outfly the sun. Soon its vast heat beat down on his face and on his back, and the great wings stuck on with wax. The wax softened. The wax trickled. The wax dripped. One feather came unstuck. Then a plume of feathers fluttered slowly down. Icarus stopped flapping his wings. His words came back, his father's words came back to him clearly now. Don't fly too close to the sun. With a great sucking noise, the wax on his shoulders came unstuck. Icarus tried to catch hold of the wings, but they just folded up in his hands. He plunged down, two fistfuls of feathers, down and down and down. The clouds did not stop his fall. The seagulls did not catch him in their beaks. His own father could only watch as Icarus hurled headfirst into the glittering sea and sank deep down among the sharks and eels and squid. And all that was left of proud Icarus was a litter of waxy feathers floating on the sea. Now that you've listened to the audio version of the story, you'll go ahead and fill out the plot diagram. Um, make sure that you pay attention to these directions. You are going to make sure that you have all of these pieces in place. There's a short uh, definition for them. And then you are also going to remember that Mrs. Messner suggested that when you fill out a plot diagram, perhaps you would like to fill in the climax first, the resolution second, the exposition third, and then perhaps you would go back uh, and fill in some rising action events. Um, it has one, two, three, four, five here. Uh, I think we are okay with three. And then it's got the two over here, and you do need both of these, okay? And then also make sure you have identified the conflict.